My name is Phil Parazio, and I'm a urologic oncologist, a surgeon. Like many of you, I absolutely love what I do, and I would not choose another profession. But I have struggled with professional identity, practice efficiency, and wellness over the years. Operate with Zen is a podcast designed to explore a mindful approach to surgery and to being a surgeon. By discussing these struggles and mindful solutions, I hope together we can create a community of strong and healthy surgeons. Enjoy. Welcome to Operate with Zen. Today, I have the great pleasure of being joined by Dr. Ann Suskind. Ann, introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here and have this conversation with all of you. I am a urologist at UCSF, and I serve as the Associate Chair for Academic Affairs and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and as the Chief of our Neurourology and FPMRS group. And I'm also an NIH funded researcher in health services research. And my research is in frailty and surgical outcomes in older adults. And in incredibly accomplished. You and I first ran into each other in kind of the professional development circles. We both had some interests around faculty development and, and building up people around us. But tell us a little bit about your career. Obviously, incredibly accomplished as a surgeon and a surgeon scientist and a funded researcher. But where did kind of the professional development and wellness fit into this? Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, it, these things just sort of un unfold over time, right? And I would start by saying I have always had sort of that um, th a different perspective on those things. So kind of even starting at a very young age, I'll start in my childhood. Um, as many people don't know this about me, but I grew up with very unusual parents. So my father is a psychiatrist, but more notably a psychoanalyst, okay? And so as a young kid, I just used to love hearing him talk to his colleagues about patients and about people and walking me through problems and learning how he thinks. And I just felt like it was such a, um, a fascinating kind of perspective to always be understanding and interested in what motivates people. Um, and, and how people think and function. And so from a very young age, um, I was always interested in that side of things and always very curious about people. And then um, my mom on the other side of things, um, completely different from my dad, but she has a very unusual quality in that she has a very strong sense of agency. And so what I mean by agency is she's someone who never looks outside of herself for anything. So she's very self-fulfilled. And if you think about it, I mean, if I think about it, I really don't know anybody else like that. I mean, I'm not even completely like that. Um, she's not really interested in kind of the material world or depending on other people, but she knows that everything she needs is within herself. And so that combination of things was sort of my kind of platform growing up, which is probably a little bit different than, than many people. Um, and, you know, I was always interested in studying different um, kind of religious backgrounds and belief systems. So I, one of my parents is Jewish, one of my parents is Protestant. I went to an Episcopalian high school. I went to a Quaker college. I studied abroad in Nepal where I learned about Hinduism. And I was always sort of interested in understanding other people's backgrounds. And, you know, to that effect, I became an anthropology major in college. Um, mainly, you know, I was always pre-med, but my intent was I wanted to study abroad in Nepal and go somewhere completely different and learn a completely different culture, religion, uh, language, background, etc. I love doing that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and so I did, and I, the, I just kind of have always been curious and collecting these different cultural, uh, psychological perspectives my whole life. And so then, uh, strangely enough, I decided to become a surgeon. 
I went into urology because I was interested mainly in women's health and helping women. And at the time, um, as you're probably aware, the workforce was only 6% female. So I thought it would be a really neat way to go about doing things. And I also liked the kind of psychological side um, that was related to some of these issues. Um, so I, you know, knew I wanted to go into academics and I, you know, developed this interest in health services research. I, you know, I can talk more about that if you want, but sort of down the path, I, um, was really fortunate to have excellent, excellent mentorship along the way, particularly, uh, you know, in, um, my residency and, um, very much so in my fellowship program. I mean, extremely good mentorship and great mentorship when I got to UCSF as well. And, um, kind of learning what worked for me, what didn't work for me in terms of how people guided me along the way. And really because of this mentorship, I was really able to achieve some things really early on in my career that even surprised me. I wasn't really uh, necessarily planning things to turn out that way, but I, I got to the point where my own successes were not that exciting anymore, if, if you know what I mean. And it was like, I was looking for something more. And I was like, if, if this is it, there's, there's got to be something more, right? Um, and so, you know, publishing another paper, doing another project, it, it was fun, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like it was when I first started. And so I quickly found mentoring as a way to really kind of aliven that excitement within me and found that, you know, I really enjoyed working with uh, junior faculty residents, uh, med students, anybody really, um, and helping them to get their first wins. That to me was super gratifying, super fulfilling. Um, and through working with people, kind of being a little bit on the other side of mentorship, um, also, you know, another way to learn how to interact with people, how to help guide people, how to give them the level of support that they need and help them find their own way. Um, it, it all just kind of came together for me and um, ended up being something that I really enjoyed doing and, and look for ways to expand upon that. That's great. It's an, it's an incredible story and, and a, a lot to unpack. Is it, is it, <laughs> I did it, it, it a lot. <laughs> but um, the first thing, I, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and, and uh, just comment on a couple of things. And, you know, we had a, a psych, I've had a couple of psychiatrists on, uh, on the podcast and one of them, Jody Foster, who was on last season, uh, who's a psychiatrist here at Penn, um, talks about the odd similarities between surgery and psychiatry. And while a lot of people think these fields are diametrically opposed, they're really not. And, and a lot of the way we manage people prior to the operating room is trying to understand kind of psychology and, and psychiatry and, and understanding how people process their disease. What are they going through? How do we help them through that as well as ourselves? So, uh, you know, I think it's a, a link that's not as well recognized and I think it's really cool. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I think that's all true, very true. And I think as surgeons, we don't have a lot of time to build rapport uh, with people. We want them to entrust us with their lives, right? And so you very quickly have to um, figure out ways to do that. And I think, you know, understanding people, listening to people, valuing them, you know, th those are kind of universal truths, right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the other really um, interesting and, and important things you said is studying religions and studying the way people process and kind of take in all of these things. And one of my favorite things to do when I talk about mindfulness and surgery or is, is express to people that almost every major spiritual belief, whether it's religious, formally religious or not, is kind of founded in presence and mindfulness and being in the moment, whether it's Jewish traditions or Catholic traditions or Christian traditions or Hinduism or Buddhism. And, and I find that really fascinating too. And I've come to kind of study other religions and other people later in life, but I think it's a really interesting phenomenon that exists throughout our cultures and throughout our world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all, we're all humans. We're all looking for the same thing and, and absolutely a lot of shared similar beliefs and experiences. Yeah. If you don't mind, t tell us a little bit about Nepal. Tell us about your, your experience there and kind of how that may have shaped you a little bit. Gosh. So um, I remember I, I, it was like a big deal for me to go back then, right? I think I was, 
19, 20 years old. And um, when I went, um, you probably don't remember this, but I remember it very clearly. There was just, I went in January and December, there was this hijacking that took place in the Kathmandu airport. And uh, while most of the world probably passed that over, it was really <laughs> for it, the forefront of my mind. Um, but I was so determined to go. My parents did not want me to go. They were like, this is such a bad idea, <laughs> right? Um, but I was, I was just absolutely determined and I knew it was something that I had to do um, and I deeply wanted to do and I knew that there would be great learning for me there. So like I said, I mean, I wanted to, I chose it because I, it wasn't a place I had been. I, I didn't know the language, the culture, the, the customs, et cetera. Um, and it, it was, it was everything. It was everything I wanted it to be. And um, we, you know, I lived in each of us. I went on a Cornell program. I went to, uh, Haverford College. We were a very small liberal arts college in Philadelphia. And, I uh, went, so they were all Cornell students. I didn't know anybody there. And we each had a Nepali roommate, which was very nice. And as part, it was sort of organized around research. So they wanted each of us to complete a research project during the time that we were there. So we spent the first few months planning this research project. And then we spent a month in the field uh, and everybody went out to different parts of uh, the country and lived with a research, a research assistant who was basically a peer, like a college student who could translate for us and help, help navigate us. And then we came back and wrote it up and, and presented it uh, as, you, as you would in college. And so I was, like I said, I was always interested in women's health. And so the year that I was there was actually the first year that the government allowed and actually mandated uh, teaching of reproductive health in secondary school, which is like our high school. And so before then, it was a taboo subject. Um, and the, just as some background, Nepal is a, the only constitutionally Hindu country in the world. And so they're very conservative, very tightly controlled in terms of the educational curriculum. And so they were allowing, not only allowing, but requiring teaching uh, reproductive health. So I thought, this is a great opportunity. So I went into schools and uh, spoke to the young women who underwent this curriculum. And so I did something like, I, it, you know, it sounds impressive, but I, I, I handed out like over 500 surveys. Turns out they were translated horribly. <laughs> like, I mean, it sounds impressive, but you know, you know how these things go. And then, I, but what was really interesting is I ended up doing these 10 focus groups with my Nepali liaison translator. And really talking to these women and learning about their experiences, hearing their stories, and it was really phenomenal. And um, all the things that that we take for granted, they had no idea. And it turns out that this um, this instruction that I thought was a great idea and so wonderful of the government to teach um, was actually a vehicle of the government to help control family size. And it was all about family planning and making sure that everybody had one child. And so they didn't teach about anything that would be helpful for young women and men um, in going forth in, in their lives. So women still didn't understand that they were gonna start menstruating. You know, the stories that I heard, um, you may have heard similar stories that everybody thought they were being punished by God or dying or all these horrible things. I mean, if, can you imagine? Um, they had no understanding of their bodies, um, let alone reproductive health, right, as we think of it. So it was really a fascinating experience for me. And, um, you know, it kind of started me on, um, you know, propelled me in my interest in um, women's health uh, beyond that. It's incredible. It's an incredible story and, and incredible what you can learn just by getting out of our comfort zones and, mm -hmm. and forcing yourself to get on that plane and making your parents a little nervous and um, understandable why they'd be a little nervous. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure my daughters are going to do that to me too. So uh, yeah, get I, I, ready. Hope, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be ready, but I'm excited for it. I will tell you that. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you do any or, or learn any mindfulness pra practices or techniques when you were in Nepal? You know, um, if, if, may I just speak on mindfulness for a second? Sure. Because uh, mindfulness, to be honest, is this uh, like idea that I don't really understand. And I, I understand we use it all the time, but um, it's, it, it's so different than how I think about these things, right? So when, it, I, you know, it's a very 
important topic. It's a very, become a very mainstream topic, which is very interesting. But the way I think about these things are, are, are not necessarily things that we um, uh, do, but kind of a, a transition of the way that we are being, right? So we are, we're human beings, we're not human doers, right? And um, it's really the way I think about what I think people think about when they talk about mindfulness and, and wellness is really a complete sh transformational shift in the way that we are being in the world in every moment of our life. And so it really comes, you know, and, and, and that goes back from, you know, all the things, my experiences in my life and kind of my uh, mindset and growing up in the household that I grew up, but it's really all um, within ourselves and in, um, in our choices and how we live every single moment of our life. So I don't know if that, that makes, makes sense or sounds strange. No, I think it's, it's wonderful. And I mean, listen, we all, you know, you can Google the definitions of mindfulness and we see things about being present, being not judgmental, but you're right. It's not just about that second, that moment of being present and non-judgmental, but it's extending that presence and non-judgmental nature. You're right to how you are and who you are being, because it, it doesn't matter if you're present one minute and then five minutes later, you're a raging maniac in the operating room, right? It's, which, which many of us can do. I mean, I've been there certainly myself, right? And um, yeah, and it really is, um, it, it really is just a, a, a part, a, an orientate, a self-orientation to every moment of your life. That's the yeah. way I kind of see it. So I, I think your question was what I learned in Nepal about yeah. that. Um, I mean, I, I think there was just, you know, Nepal is one of the, the poorest countries in the world. And, and that was a, just a really great experience to, to live, um, among the poverty really. And, um, and, but I would never describe it as a poor country because everybody is, I shouldn't say everybody, but people are so, live their life with such grace and gratitude and are so, um, so giving of what they have um, and of who they are. And there's just this abundant, there's an abundance there. There's an abundance there um, that's really so beautiful. And so I certainly uh, hopefully took some of that away with me and, I, I just, you know, it was just a real time for me of kind of in, in internal blossoming and growth and, and learning in every single aspect of, of my life. But I think that the, um, in terms of um, what the people taught me, I think just, just their, their sheer grace and abundance and, uh, and gratitude is something I'll always remember. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and that you know, we think of abundance, especially in this country about material goods, right? Money and food and clothing, but abundance is really subjective, right? It's what you give of yourself and what you give of the, the little or the lot that you have. So abundance really is subjective. I love that story you told. Oh, abundance is such a great topic. I mean, I, I, I could talk for hours on <laughs> abundance because we all are all abundant. You were, we have abundance within us in it, you know, you can wealth or material things is just one little piece, but abundance is a mindset and we have unlimited kind of resources within each one of us. We are intrinsically abundant. I mean, look at nature, you go walking in the woods and there, it, there's no lack of anything. Um, and so to me, abundance is just living in that state of not Latin, you know, the opposite of scarcity, right? But living in the state where you're you're fully empowered and with knowledge and abundance of knowledge and everything, knowing that everything you need is within. Yeah. And um, I know you didn't wake up one day and just all of a sudden feel this way. Um, yeah. this, this is a process of, as you said, of being of be of yeah. a human being. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that process and and how you work towards these things and and you know when you talk about it and whether it's yoga or mindfulness or whatever me it's a practice we're always working at these things we're always getting better so tell us a little bit of your practice and, and it is work yeah i mean it, work we're always afraid of the word work but it's it's it maybe not work but it's discipline you know it's making i mean 
making a conscious choice that I wanted to change certain things in my life, right? And being disciplined about doing in with repetition about doing those things. So, you know, and the other thing I didn't mention, but I, you know, studied with a teacher for several years and uh, 10 years now, and that really was a turning point for me. And just kind of learning a lot of this knowledge and imp integrating into my life and um, it takes time. You're absolutely right. I mean, I don't think it can happen overnight. Maybe it can for some people. For me, it's it's taken years and years of practice and because you can't get everything all at once. It's like anything in life. I remember on my first day of medical school, a pulmonologist came to talk to us about learning knowledge in medical school and he described it as that spiral, right? And so the same knowledge kind of comes around over and over and over. And each time you're in a place where you can get more and more out of it. Um, and that's exactly how this is. So you might learn a few concepts and, you know, sounds really straightforward, right? All of this stuff sounds really super simple. And then um, you, you don't necessarily integrate it or embody it into your life because you're not ready for it. And that's okay. You're in a place where you get what you need at that time. And then a year or two later, you're in a different place and you're able to hear something in a new way or experience something differently and embody it in a new way. And that's what it takes. And I, I hope it never stops, right? And so even though I've been doing this for a long time, I'm, uh, you know, I, there's so much more that I can learn and, um, and um, hopefully will continue to learn for, for the rest of my life and continue on that spiral. But that's really how I see it. So, and I think that it all happens in due time, depending on kind of where you are and what you need at that point in time. And depending on what's going on in your life at the time. And sometimes you just need to get by. You just need to kind of get through the next thing and you've got a lot on your plate and maybe that's not the right time for you to, to make major changes in your life. Um, but then there are other times where you're more open and um, able to integrate and those are great times to, to soak things up and it's going to fluctuate over time. So it's definitely, definitely an ongoing process. Yeah, it's a great point. And I'm going to smash a couple of kind of mindfulness terms together. But I often talk to especially our residents and some of the trainees about it, about being purposefully intentional with mm -hmm. what you're doing, right? Think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you're right, you, you learn different things every time you kind of come around and you experience these things. But if you're not working towards a goal or in a direction, you, you totally may miss some of those things. And I'm always happily surprised that if you're paying attention, if you're focused on where you want to go, you always get something out of kind of the experience, right? It's always like, oh, that's exactly what I needed. Yeah. I don't know if it, 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 if it's set out to be that way, but it always seems like you get something out about if you're focused on where you want to be and if you set up a purpose and you're yeah. thoughtful about what you want to do. And if you're open to it not being what you expected or wanting wanted it to be, right? So and to, I you know, always try to enter into something thinking, okay, the hoping for working towards the outcome that is for my highest good. It may not be exactly what I think I want, but it, 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 it will be something that will, um, will help me in some way. Right. Yeah. And that's really hard because that means you, you have to do things and not be attached to the outcome. Right. And so you, you referenced this course that I, I put out there. I had to put that out there and, um, and not be attached to the outcome. But of course I desperately wanted people to, uh, to get something out of it and to, to think that it was a great course. But then I had to take a step back and be like, okay, you know, I've, I've put out content that I think is important and valuable to me and, you know, whoever resonates with it, then, then I hope that it serves them, but to not be attached to any particular outcome. And it's, it's like that with everything. And it's hard. It's hard. Particularly, you know, for for people like uh, like us and many surgeons who are very goal oriented and uh, tend to be a little perfectionistic and want things to go a certain way, it's really a um, a deviation from that way of thinking. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, we're going to get specifically into your course, but I will say, uh, being in your first cohort, it was a huge success for me. I know it's going to be a huge success for for other people. So uh, I know you're not attached to the outcome, but smashing success in my eyes, and I know it will be for others too. But I want to get a little bit to con a little bit more concrete about what you said before about wanting to change something about yourself. Right? You said, okay. you know, if I I want to change X, whatever that may be. Yeah. Um. 
let's talk about an example, one or two that either personally you've gone through or seen in some of the surgeons around you, you know, a behavior or a pattern or a feeling, something that wanted to change and how somebody could go about do that, doing that. Uh, so that's a great question. And the hardest part, I think, is becoming aware of something within yourself that you want to change because it's uncomfortable for us to look at ourselves and see something that we don't like. We know it's there, but we tend to, to try to bury those things and to compensate or, or, or move on um, from them. So, so let me think about this for a second, if I can give you an example from myself. Um, so, you know, one, one thing in myself that I've been working on is I, I find for me sometimes in clinic, I get easily frustrated, right? When things aren't done the way that, that I want them to be done. And, you know, someone didn't get vitals or someone, um, you know, got, didn't get roomed and I, I would get kind of irritated with people, right? So first kind of acknowledging that, okay, so I have this, this um, irritation in me, okay? Um, and really, it's, it's not about the other people around me. They're doing things that, realizing they're doing things that are kind of pushing my buttons, but uh, I installed the buttons, right? They're, they're there because of, of me. They're not there because of the other person. The other person is actually doing me a favor by showing me that there's something within myself that I want to work on, right? Because I don't want people to think I'm irritated or not nice or, or whatever it is, right? And so first of all, recognizing that and then recognizing that it's not the other person, okay? The other person's doing me a favor, okay? I need to be grateful to them. It's actually within me. And what that does is that shifts my perspective, okay? So I can't blame somebody else. It's never about, it really is never about the other person. It's always about me from this kind of vantage point, okay? And I talk about this a little bit in the course. Uh, and that gives me the power to change the only thing that I have control over, which is myself, okay? And so realizing that kind of empowers me to make that shift. And then I have to decide, I have to make a decision, is this something that I'm committed to changing within myself? And um, if it is, then it, it takes some work. It absolutely takes some work. Um, but it becomes much easier once I've committed to myself because, you know, once I've made a commitment to myself, gosh darn it, I'm going to do it, right? Uh, and, and, and so then um, catching myself when, uh, you know, part of it is catching myself when I'm in that state and then going even beyond that. So why am I getting, why am I getting irritated? Why am I getting frustrated? Uh, what's behind that? Going a little bit deeper. And for me, you know, I, I'm, it, it, you know, I have to do that inner work. And it's like, well, why, why is this showing up for me in this way? What is it about me? And what do I need to look at more closely and going there, not hiding it, but actually going, going in deeper. And um, so those are kind of some of the initial steps that I take in myself and I found very helpful. And then also kind of taking a step away from the situation. So if I'm catching myself in that, maybe taking a step back, giving myself a moment, not trying not to respond if I'm in a state that I don't want to be in, and then kind of choosing the state that I want to be in. So maybe I want to lead from a more compassionate or kind place and really calling that into myself and, um, and consciously cultivating that and then taking an action from that place. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, it, it's certainly a process that we work through in, your, in, the, in the course, um, but I think it's a really important process and, it, and it's true for things like frustration. It can also be true for something like a technical skill in the operating group, right? You're doing something wrong. Um, it could be something in, with relationships with colleagues or outside of the hospital. And people often will call attention to our flaws. It's just, are we receptive to that? And the only way we're going to get better is if we're receptive to things. None of us is perfect. None of us is perfect. Everybody listening, I hope you know that you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. <laughs> Anne's not perfect. For you sure. try. Yeah, absolutely. And people tell us, they give us cues when we're not being perfect. And they give us areas and opportunities to improve, but you have to be open and you have to be able to listen to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the 
feedback comes in all forms, <laughs> right? And the feedback's a whole other topic. It's so hard to give feedback, but it's the greatest gift you can give someone sometimes, you know, if if they're able to hear it. And that's a whole other whole other topic. But when in you know we're talking about ourselves, and I think it's you, you've got to have some level of insight, some level of commitment to yourself. Um, and, you know, being, being open to receiving feedback, even if it's not directly labeled as feedback, it's always happening all, all around us. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's get a little into your, into your course and, um, it's called unlock your power. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a five week course that we spent every Tuesday night together in uh, a bunch of kind of modules and in, in small group sessions, kind of talking with you and working through these things. And, and I'll let you kind of explain it to the audience, but I would just tell everybody that, you know, my kind of brief, brief synopsis, brief takeaway from this um, is that it was incredibly empowering. And it was a way to, what you gave us all was a way to look inside of ourselves, a way to get better and a way to do it with love and compassion for ourselves and for others. And I, I hope that's what you're trying to, to send out because that's what I received. But um, I'd love to hear you explain it to the, to the audience. And uh, I thought it was an incredibly powerful five weeks. Well, I'm so happy that that's what you got out of it because that was exactly the goal. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, so I kind of started when I was creating the course, I started backwards and, you know, this, this kind of came out of conversations that I was having with not only mentees, but colleagues, um, people who are more senior to me, people in my life, just, you know, the last two years have been kind of awful for everybody and everybody has been going through some, something. And I, I kind of realized that everybody was struggling with the same sorts of issues. They were coming up over and over again. People don't realize their own power. People don't realize their own value. People don't have the tools of how to shift these things. Um, and so that's where it came from. And I started with this idea of how do I get people to realize their own power? And I worked backwards. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so it's a five week course. Um, and the first kind of module was really kind of the setup for the whole course and understanding what is holding you back. Okay, so go on, and I broke it down into five premises premises of uh, different things that I've noticed that we do to ourselves to hold ourselves back and becoming aware of those. Um, and then the next several courses moved into different qualities that are empowering, that build us, uh, lead us towards our own self-empowerment and really go, taking a deep dive into these qualities, maybe exploring them. They're all things that we all have within us and we all know about and we have all experienced but maybe exploring them hopefully in a way that's a little bit novel, uh, a little bit different, and um, helps people to develop a new relationship with them and really embody them. Uh, so we spent a week on compassion um, and a lot of uh, time on self-compassion, which I think is, is so, so important. Um, we spent time on wisdom, humility, courage, clarity, and finally power. And then from that state of power is really the state from which you can make, create things in your life and tools for creation. So that's that's the overall, overall overarching arc of the class. And then I tried to pepper in some practical tips and tricks and exercises that people can um, call on in their day-to-day -day life that might be able to aid them in certain things, certain practices. Um, and with, with the idea that not everything is going to probably suit everybody, but hopefully there's one or two things that each individual can take with them moving forward that they can put in their toolbox. Um, and then also time for discussion, interaction, sharing. I think that that's really important. Uh, and then I've also built in for those who are interested in taking the work a little deeper, um, some guided reflections, journalings, and exercises to do in between the sessions to really support people to go, go deeper and explore, um, explore further. So that's, that's the, that's the intent of the course. Yeah. And, and it was great. And, um, you know, the audience, when we were there, um, it was all, it was all surgeons uh, and mm -hmm. it was an incredibly uh, diverse 
group of surgeons and some really powerful people. And I don't mean that just necessarily by rank or stature. I mean, there were some very junior people who were incredibly powerful in that room, but also yeah. incredibly vulnerable. And yeah. it, it was, it was really um, great to see everybody share their vulnerabilities and work towards kind of a, a joint sense of power and improvement. And I, I thought that was a, a, a great kind of perk that, to being in that group. And uh, yes, awesome. And then that, and I'm so glad you touched on vulnerability because that to be powerful, we do have to be vulnerable, right? And oftentimes we think the vulnerability is weakness, but really um, it, is, it is a step towards our own empowerment. And my hope is that when people share and open up and are vulnerable, that they really are, you know, uh, empowering themselves. And, um, and, and that, 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 well, that was, that's the intent. So to help create this, this atmosphere where people feel comfortable being vulnerable. Yeah. And I would say, you know, wh while we're sharing it in kind of surgical and neurologic circles, it, it is certainly, I think, you know, applicable to a variety of people and professions. And I think kind of the core concepts are, are widely applicable to anyone who, is interested in reflecting and interested in getting better. And I think a lot of us are. Yes. Yeah. Great. And uh, yeah, thanks for saying that. Certainly all, all are welcome. Um, and it is not necessarily surgeon specific. Yeah. Good. So, you know, there were some techniques you gave us during, during the course, we did some formal, formal mindfulness stuff. I'm going to put it in, in, in yep. air quotes now, but, um, but we also did things like journaling. Um, tell us what kind of your practice is now in terms of your, your personal practice in terms of mindfulness, journaling, what are the things you explore uh, to kind of help in your daily or weekly you know, routine? I do a lot of things. <laughs> um, so I do a, a, a brief meditation every morning that's about 10 to 15 minutes. And I do some other things to just kind of help focus myself and center myself. And that to me is really important for kind of setting my day up right. And I think that it's important for me to do it in the morning before the day starts. Um, so, so that's one of the things that I do. Um, I, um, you know, I, I, I try to, to integrate all these things into my daily life. So whether I'm in the operating room, I'm in the clinic, I'm with colleagues, I'm with friends, I'm with family. It doesn't matter. There's no distinction um, between the different parts of my life. I try to, um, you know, live my life from these principles and mainly meaning that I try to keep myself aligned with who I want to be and, and who I am at my core, right? Um, I do additional stuff. Sometimes I journal. So, um, sometimes I, um, you know, I just always kind of reflect on, I'm, I'm a very re self-reflective person. So I usually towards the end of the day, kind of take time to reflect in my day. I also have groups of people who I talk to, um, who are, uh, doing similar types of work that I am. Um, and I have one particular group that we talk every Thursday and we have for maybe five years. And that's a core group for me to, um, to talk about these things and to have this outlet to give me ideas. Um, we, um, I think we take each other further. Um, and I think having a sort of community of people that you can do this kind of work with is priceless, really, because they, they, they support you and they, um, they, they're, it's a good reminder. And it also helps me to reset myself. So, you know, if I, I get flustered or off course, it's, you know, a weekly reminder to, uh, to come back to myself, to take that time for myself. And I, and I, I, I hardly ever miss it. Um, and, and that's just something that organically arose um, over, over time and, and we've, we've kept with it. Um, none of them are doctors, they're, they're just people I know uh, and who have become friends. Um, I, for me, going out into nature is one of the most centering things that I can do for myself. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in California and I, I love being near the water and the ocean. And to me, that's very centering. And I live in San Francisco now and I love going to near woods. I love going to the, being among the trees and the woods also um, and being in, in the abundance of nature. And I find that when I'm in nature, there's no, 
past or future. There's really only the present. So it's to me, that's very, um, very helpful. I think movement's really important, um, moving the body, um, whatever it is, even if I just have 10 minutes going out, taking a, a walk around the block, and uh, that helps me to kind of clear my mind and bring me back to myself. Um, so those are just kind of a couple of things <laughs> that, that I do. Yeah, that's great. You know, uh, we've talked a bunch on this podcast with, with other people about talking about journaling. We've talked about mindfulness mm-hmm. practices, but I think you bring up some really good uh, really great alternative kind of mindfulness practices. And the first is this doesn't mindfulness, not only doesn't it have to be, but it shouldn't be a solo effort, right? Being in a community and being in a group is a great way to be mindful and be present with other people. And I point this out to surgeons all the time. There's, I think Seema C- Porton, your, your colleague said this. And good know, friends. And yeah. good friend. Seema mm-hmm. is amazing. Said, yeah. Listen, there's no more mindful place than the operating room. We're all focused on, or can be no more mindful place than the operating room. We're all focused on a patient and that problem. And everybody, if it's working well, should be focused singularly on that one thing. So the, oh, oper- the, o- yeah, the OR has the opportunity to be an incredible mindful place, yeah. but so do other community settings. And yeah. sports or other forms of movement can certainly do that. Um, I play basketball. It could be bowling. It could be dart night. I mean, it could be anything you want it to be. Getting out in nature frees the mind. I, I love all of these things that, that you're bringing forth as ways for people who want to be more mindful, but are really kind of nervous or skeptical about sitting down and crossing their legs on a mat or a pillow. Yeah. Um, these are great ways to be mindful and to be present and, and work on the things you want to. Yeah. And, and just because you, you touched on community, I mean, it's, I just can't emphasize enough how important that is um, for us. And uh, what I hope moving forward is that, you know, people who've gone through this class or whatever will form a sort of community and, um, and, or, or just in general, people will go out and share what they've learned with their, their friends and, um, I, I think that um, there's so much opportunity for change. You know, all of our major structures in this world are, are going through a huge transformation, be it, you know, the banking system, the education system, um, the, our governments, and certainly medicine, okay? So medicine is ripe for change and change is already happening and it's gonna be happening in an accelerated way. And what better, you know, way for us to kind of focus all of our efforts um, is to make medicine a, uh, you know, more inclusive and wonderful um, discipline uh, than it is already and to kind of usher in that change through, through these concepts. Yeah, you and I certainly share in, in that belief. And it was one of the major motivations I started this podcast is just wow. to normalize it and say, not only is it okay to have these conversations, we should have these conversations as surgeons on a regular basis. This is important to who we are and being better, better human beings. So thanks for sharing that mission. Yeah, thank you. Thanks um, for sharing the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I want to get into um, a couple of the other aspects of your life, um, academic medicine, surgery, <laughs> grant writing, all of those kinds of things. And how does kind of being purposeful or intentional or mindful help you in, in those areas? And we can tackle whatever one you want to do first or in whatever order you want to do it. (laughs) I'm not sure where to go. Um, I think that it gives me an, um, an underlying purpose to what I'm doing. And I find that when I have a purpose to what I'm doing, it happens a lot easier. Okay, so um, for example, if I'm working towards something and struggling, okay, um, I need to stay, take a step back and, um, and kind of do this evaluation. So for example, when I use this example all the time, when I first started at uh, UCSF um, almost eight years ago, you know, I'd just gone through this fellowship at Michigan and I'd worked with um, on this specific type of project. I was really facile or worked a lot with Medicare data and I designed this project based on the resources at Michigan and the learning that I had at Michigan uh, to do when I started at UCSF, okay? So um, it was like I planned this project 
as if I were staying at Michigan, okay? <laughs> um, but then I took it to UCSF. So I get to UCSF, everything fell flat, okay? I couldn't find the right mentors. I couldn't find the right resources. I was just like pushing, pushing, pushing and knocking on all these doors and it wasn't moving very smoothly. And so um, I actually had phenomenal mentors. Um, one of them was, is a colorectal surgeon who had trained at Michigan, Emily Finlayson. Um, and who's just an absolute rock star of a person. Uh, and the other one, Louise Walter, who is um, a, the chair of geriatrics at UCSF. And they, they did an intervention with me. And they sat me down and they said, they actually took me out to dinner, which was nobody, no mentor had ever taken me out to dinner before. I thought this was amazing. And they're like, we, we want to talk to you about your research. And I was like, oh no, what, what's going on? And they're like, we think you should change directions. And they're like, we don't think what you're doing is working. And we think you should go into aging research. Okay. Well, the rest is history because that made my career. That one dinner conversation made my career. And what they did is they gave me permission to, um, to realize that what I wasn't doing, what I was doing wasn't working. Okay. Because I was certainly in this mindset where I had to make it work right? How many of us have been there? We had an idea. We wanted to do this. We told people we were going to do this. I actually, I wrote a grant saying I was going to do this, right? Uh, and so I thought I had to do this and otherwise I would be a total failure. They gave me permission to say, I actually don't have to do this. I can change and do something I really wanted to do. Um, and everything unfolded from there because it was more in alignment with what I wanted to do and what was available to me. Um, so I think that that's a good example. I wasn't, this was eight years ago. Okay. I was very early in on my career and my, my path. Um, but looking back on it, I didn't realize it at the time, but that's exactly what happened is I was trying to make something work. I was trying to probably, you know, uh, do what my mentors at Michigan had wanted me to do or suggested that I did. And there was nothing wrong with that. Um, but it wasn't working for me in where I was. And so realizing that and, um, and making a shift and, and everything from there unfolded without any effort, really, it just kind of fell into place because it was, it was kind of in alignment with my interests. Yeah, it's amazing how that happens when kind of purpose and passion and interest mm -hmm. and all of that kind of aligns, it becomes easier. You get more... Yeah. Um, you know, one of the other guests used the term discretionary energy, you get more discretionary energy, you have more, you know, just more available to you to kind of work in the direction you want to. That's totally true. And so, you know, I use that. Now, if I really, if I feel like I'm fighting something, or it's not going easily, I try to remember that. And, and think, okay, how, how can I re redirect this towards something that will, that will be more fulfilling? Yeah. And I, and I just think it's important to make clear for the audience, you know, for, for those people out there who are thinking of academic careers and want to write grants and do this, recognize that very few grants who set out with their specific aims actually achieve and reach the exact 100%. specific aims, right, that they set out to. <laughs> Things always pivot. They're always going in a different direction. And the key is having the flexibility and the knowledge and the, the understanding that they're going to change and going with it. The yeah. other part of that is for the people who are not interested in academics, these examples carry through to other aspects of life, whether it's your clinical practice, whether it's your home life, whatever it may be, nothing is ever going to go as planned and be flexible with it. Understand it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it's going to move in the direction you want it to, as long as you're kind of passionate, committed to it. And it may turn out far better than you ever expected. Right. In a completely different direction. In a completely different way than you thought. Yeah. yeah, no, really, really, really important points. Um, well, good. Um, so we're getting kind of close to an hour here. So I always like to give um, our guests the opportunity. If there's anything I didn't cover, anything you want to talk about, the floor is yours and uh, happy to go in any direction you want. Well, I mean, I, I think I'll just kind of to stay on topic and um, just really, you know, I set out in creation of this course because I really wanted to people to feel empowered and to realize that you know they they can create anyone without exception can create whatever they want in their life it's just kind of about harnessing the right tools and um, the the right way to go about doing it and so um, there's always an opportunity to make um, to change towards something that you're really passionate about 
um, and um, and just pe want people to know that every single person is um, completely powerful and that their power lies in their uniqueness, right? In their ability to do things in a way that nobody else can do them and to, to really lean into that. Well, thank you. So um, before we summarize, just, um, you know, Ann Suskind's here. Unlock Your Power is the name of the course. When can we uh, give a rough timeline for second uh, for the second cohort if people are interested? <laughs> um, I'm thinking probably late summer, maybe fall. Okay. Um, so yeah, if people are interested, I'll, um, I'm collecting an interest list. So just people can email me. Do you want, should I give my email? Yeah, give your email and I'll, okay. I'll put the, uh, I won't put your email on the podcast, but I'll put, I can put links if you'd like. Um, so my email, yeah, you can put my email. My email yeah. is uh, suskina, S-U-S-K-I-N-A at gmail.com. So email me. I'd be happy to put you on an interest list and let you know um, when the next course is available if you're interested. That's wonderful. Well, and thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. I'm just going to kind of run through some of the really powerful things uh, that you said over the course of the last hour. Um, I thought one of the first really powerful things you said is that, listen, we're human beings, not human doers. And we have to think about a transformational shift to being, not necessarily doing. And I think that was a really important concept. You talked a lot about discipline. And if you want to change yourself from X to Y, you have to be disciplined to notice that. You have to be open to the changes. And, um, and, uh, and you have to be willing to improve. Um, and, and it's going to take work to get there. You said... Um, that your, your purpose and your uh, vision should be kind of aligned with who you want to be. We talked about mindfulness not needing to be a solo venture and a solo journey, but really get involved in community and spreading the word about mindfulness and passion and improving who we are and empowerment, getting out in nature, moving our bodies, expressing ourselves in a variety of ways. And then finally, aligning our purpose and passions to truly be empowered. Great. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, well, it was wonderful chatting with you as always. I look forward to seeing you in person in one of our upcoming meetings. And uh, wonderful. thanks again for spending time. Well, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for taking the time. Appreciate it.